Hello, I'm Elizabeth St. John, and I would like to read to you a short story that I wrote called Christmas at Lydiard Park. And first of all, I'd like to read just a brief author's note um, to tell you what inspired me to write the story. So American Field Hospital 302 was built on the grounds of Lydiard Park, Wiltshire, and in 1944, it was turned into a prison of war hospital for German soldiers injured after D-Day. Captain Edward St. John, the Golden Cavalier in St. Mary's Church, Lydia Tregose, sustained mortal wounds at the Battle of Newbury and died at Lydiard House in 1644. Hark the Herald Angels Sing was first noted as a Christmas hymn in the mid 1600s. And uh, just as a final footnote, December 1944 was a particularly cold month and the first white Christmas at Lydiard Park for many years. So here's my story. St. Mary's Church, Christmas Eve, 1944. Candlelight illuminated the medieval wall paintings and above the altar, gold stars shone from the midnight blue domed ceiling. The German prisoner of war choir sang still and Nacht in poignant harmony, their voices weaving descant and tenor counterpoints of joy. Joyce was drawn as always to the statue in the shadows a man emerging from his battle tent, armor gleaming. The stone cavalier shone burnished gold, his features distinct as she had never seen before. The candle flames shimmered as tears filled her eyes. Christmas Eve and her family clear across the other side of England with no hope of a pass to see them. And yet there was a reason for her to stay. The young German officer in field hospital 302 was still in the ferocious grip of a fever his life in danger. He had scarcely spoken since he had been brought into the camp. And by early December, when the handsome surgeon she had thought she loved returned to his wife in New York, her vigil at Captain Eric Hoffman's bedside helped pass her sleepless nights. She pushed her pale blonde hair back under her nurse's hood and gathered her warm navy cloak close. Almost midnight and her shift would begin. These few moments of peace would be all she had to sustain her during the darkest hours of Christmas morning. Captain Edward St. John slipped into hut nine as he did every night. And when the ward sister lifted her head from her notes, he paused. She walked briskly to the narrow door and tugged the blackout curtains shut against the sudden draft. Edward smiled. He looked around the ward, no new rivals tonight, thanks be to God. The strangers had built the hospital on the grounds of Lydia Park in July. And when the wounded German prisoners started arriving after D-Day, Edward spent his nights walking the crowded wards, bringing comfort to those delirious with pain and fearful of death. He recalled his last Christmas at Lydia, when his own battle wounds drew a veil over his sight and coldness descended upon him. Did he know even then that this would be his last? Perhaps his father did, for he never left his side. And when the spring came and his dearest Lewis arrived, Edward knew in his heart that he would not live beyond Easter. And so each night he walked between the beds of the sick and dying, speaking to the men as only one soldier could to another. In truth, he had not seen such wounds as these, for there were little from the sword and many from a musket. But despite the care of the surgeons, the men were still so vulnerable. And if there was a way to help these nurses who reminded him so much of his Luce and his Aunt Lucy, he would do so. To some men, he could bring comfort, but others would not accept that he heralded their own mortality. This young soldier in bed seven, dear God, how much he reminded him of his cousin, Alan, his handsome features now contorted with pain. He was next. Edward must ease his path and honor his bravery by walking with him. Eric, he whispered, Eric, you may let go. There is peace at hand and your pain will be over. The young German officer groaned and shook his head. His dark hair flopped over his brow and Edward gently pushed it back from his damp forehead. My angel, the man called, wo ist sie? Come with me, Edward said. I will take you home now, Eric. Nein, nein, Eric's eyes fluttered open, charcoal gray in the dim light of the hut. Please, my angel, bring her. Edward knew only too well how a last glimpse of those loved ones was all that a man desired in his last hours. 
and how that wish had been denied him on his own journey. Wait then, replied Edward. He glanced around the ward. Sister was at her desk, her back to him. Drawing the blanket around Eric, he nodded and slipped through the door again. If he could delay Eric's departure so he could say goodbye to the nurse, he would. But there was so little time. In St. Mary's Church, Joyce gathered up her Bible. As she nodded her head to the stone cavalier, wishing him a peaceful Christmas as he stood in his golden armor in his Civil War tent, her eye was caught by a man sitting at the end of her pew. And surely he was not there a moment ago. And as the choir sang the first verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing, the man turned to her, and she found herself looking into a familiar countenance that she could not quite place. He was muffled in a great cloak, old-fashioned in its cut. His hair was long, pulled back by a ribbon so unusual for these days. Nurse Mayfield, he asked urgently, under the rising chorus of the choir. Yes, she replied. How did you know my name? The man smiled and reached out a hand to her. His glove was thick leather with a wide cuff. She glimpsed a froth of lace beneath. Please, I would ask you to accompany me. He caught the reluctance in her. Uh, you are quite safe. I just want to escort you across the park to the hospital. Sister sent me on an urgent mission. Captain Hoffman, he nodded, his face grave. Yes. Slipping quietly from the pew, Joyce followed the man through the ancient oak door. His cloak brushed polished brown riding boots. He lifted his head as the strains of Hark the Herald Angels sing echoed from within the church. My favorite hymn, he said quietly. I heard it first here at Lydia. Mine too, she replied. At her words, a single flake of snow drifted down into the pool of light from the church porch, and she shivered as the man pulled her hood over her head to protect her from the winter weather. He swiftly led her around the front of the old mansion. The darkness enveloped him, and he picked up a lantern left on the doorstep of the deserted house. Its tremulous flame reflected upon the glistening snow that was settling on the lawns. And for a moment, she thought she saw candlelight within the rooms beyond the darkness. She shook her head, for it could only be her imagination. The house was long empty of the last of the St. John family. Across the park, the man strode confidently, as if he had walked these areas many times before. As they approached the guardhouse to the camp, Joyce waved at the duty sergeant. He raised his mug of tea to her. Good night, Miss Joyce, he called. Merry Christmas. Good night, Arthur, she replied, and please allow my... She turned, but the man was no longer at her side. Puzzled, she looked around and saw him already across the field, standing by the entrance to Hut 9. Go on with you, Arthur had settled back to his warm guard post, and hurry, before the snow falls thicker. Inside the hut, Joyce quickly removed her cloak, shaking the last of the snowflakes from the dark, wool, dark blue wool. Sister gestured to the far corner. Captain Hoffman is very weak, she said shortly. You'd best stay with him. Laura can take the other beds tonight. Joyce walked to the captain's bedside, still wondering who the man was who had guided her from the church. In the dim light, Eric's pale face gleamed. As she turned the lamp low, she opened the blackout curtain a few inches, revealing a crack of window. Against the darkness, a whirl of snowflakes kissed the glass and Captain turned his face towards them. Home, he murmured, the snow falls so in Bavaria. She could not speak for the sadness in her throat and taking his hand, she sat with him as the snow drifted by the window and his hand grew slack in hers. She must have dozed for the next she knew the pale light of dawn was edging through the window and within minutes, the first rays of the rising sun pierced the morning. Joyce gasped for Eric lay still. She closed her eyes to stop her tears from falling, whispering a farewell blessing. A gradual well-being warmed her, and when the light brought a golden glow to her closed lids, she opened her eyes to find Eric gazing at her, his own eyes clear and a smile on his lips. My angel, he whispered, you came to me when I needed you most. She could not speak for the joy that leapt in her heart. His eyes were a translucent gray and unclouded. Eric's fever had broken. Through the window, across the sparkling snow to the woodland that led to the mansion, 
she glimpsed a shadow in the bare trees. A man in a long cloak, booted, his hair tied back with a ribbon. He lifted a hand and then walked into the woods, leaving no trace in the fresh snow. She turned back to Eric. Yes, she said, I am here and you are going to be well. Happy Christmas, Eric. Happy Christmas, my angel. And thank you. I'm wishing you all a very happy, healthy Yuletide season to you and your families. Thank you.